one of the serious handicaps in traveling from one country to another is the, is the problem of languages. And I have been in some countries where I had to have one interpreter, or I prefer to call them interrupters, <coughs> and sometimes two interpreters. But it's always comfortable to be in America because while you don't speak English, at least you understand it. <coughs> The pastor said this morning that there are some people who have itching ears. I'm sure this is true because there are so many cults that are prosperous right now. But if it is true, and it is true, that there are many people with itching ears, I have no commission from God to scratch them. The text you'll find tonight in the book of Judges the 16th chapter, and verse 6, Judges, the 16th chapter, verse 6. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Tell me, wherein the secret of thy great strength lieth. That added word is in one of the European versions of the scriptures. The word added is the word secret. It's not there by inspiration, it's there at least by inference. This is a story we like to tell to children. It uh, lends itself to a great deal of color and excitement. And I think very often we pass this story on to children, like the story of David and Goliath, because it's too big for us to handle. I see in this colorful picture of Samson a type of Israel in its glory. I see a type of the church. I also see a type of the true spirit anointed believer. The story begins by a series of dramatic events in the life of Samson. Well, isn't that how the history of Israel began? Didn't she move in supernatural power out of Egypt? Wasn't she surrounded with overnatural power, supernatural power? Didn't the Church of Jesus Christ begin like that? Before he retired as the brilliant founder editor of Christianity Today, Dr. Carl F. Henry sent a questionnaire out to 20 intellectual preachers in the country. I did not know there were so many, but <clears throat> he sent out this great question to 20 great preachers, and he asked them this. What do you see for the Church of Jesus Christ by the year 2000? The answers were very interesting. I remember two of them outstandingly, and I'll quote one. One was from the very famous Quaker philosopher, a man whose theology sometimes puzzles me, but Elton Trueblood says some very stabbing things. His answer to the question was this, by the year 2000, the Church of Jesus Christ will be a conscious minority surrounded by an arrogant, militant paganism. Well, I read that and I went to sleep. I woke up about one o'clock in the morning and I turned it over in my mind and turned it over and over. The church by the year 2000 will be a conscious minority surrounded by an arrogant, militant paganism. I began to back up and ask myself, isn't that where the church of Jesus Christ is tonight? Are we not surrounded tonight by an arrogant, militant paganism? And let's back it right up to its inception. The Church of Jesus was not given to the world on a silver platter. The Church of Jesus Christ was born in a sophisticated totalitarian world. It was born under a slave system. It was born when it was handicapped in every, every possible way. I've crossed the Atlantic about 20 times. Usually I like to go by boat. I don't like flying. Personally, I think that's for the birds, but <clears throat> I do like to go by boat, and many times when we've crossed it, I've discussed with others, thought with others about the situation that the Church of Jesus Christ is in today. 
And I believe that on the threshold of 1979, the crisis in America is greater than it was in 1776. You can tell me about the deteriorating dollar. We try to pump life into it and somehow it refuses to go back into life. You can tell me about the collapse of Cambodia, Laos, those other countries where 50 million people went down the drain overnight. It didn't cost most of us a tear anyhow. You can tell me about the dismantling of those great countries in Africa. Now, I, I'll try to provoke your thinking. You know, good preaching does one of three things. It makes people glad, sad, or mad. Mine is usually in the last category. But if you're not grown up, don't come. You'll waste my time and yours. I'm going to talk to you in the next two weeks by the grace of God as though you're as serious about living your Christian life as anything that you could have this side of eternity. You see, up to this present moment, the white man has had the ball. He's fumbled it. If there's a vote in the United Nations tomorrow, out of about 52 nations, how many white nations are there there? There are no new white nations being born. Every new nation is a colored nation. I used to go through the United Nations. I was editing a paper in New York at that time. And I would go down the corridors of the United Nations and everybody I met was a very distinguished looking colored man, very often with a beautiful robe and a gold chain round his neck and some fancy thing on his head. And he would salute and speak in good English because, of course, most of them were educated in America or Oxford or Cambridge. They've got the ball at their feet. The third world is growing, our world is shrinking. And you can tell me about all the tragedies, and there are very many of them right now. Isn't it strange, isn't it almost indefinable that the, the nations that won the war are losing the war right now? The two nations that suffered most during World War II, Germany and Japan, have a stronger economy than we have who won the war. Milton Friedman is the greatest living economist, I think, is in Chicago University. And he says, I cannot understand why every nation in the world is rushing to superinflation in 1979. And as a wizard in economics, he says, I don't understand it. Somebody's sitting on the money bag. I could give you some names, but I won't. Oh, well, somebody rubs his eyes and says, listen, I'm an old man, and, uh, you know, I've seen America get out of situations like this in other nations. Well, there's one different thing the Word of God says about this hour that we're entering, to, entering into. Sure, there's been distress of nations. You see, I, I, I think we've forgotten, if we ever we thought about it, that World War I ended at 11 o'clock in the morning on the 11th day of the 11th month, 11 months from the signing of the armistice with Turkey, and 11 months from the time that Allenby entered into Jerusalem. Now, there's a series of 5 11. Do you think God was knocking on the door of humanity and saying, we're entering the midnight hour, even in 1930, uh, 1919? I say, tell me about the nation. But you see, there's one little clause that rather stirs me when I think of our present dilemma, financially, economically, morally. We're Lord in the nation, morally or immorally now than any period in history. I believe spiritually we're lower. And when you told me about the disaster in the economic world, when you told me, tell, tell, tell me about the secret moving of uh, uh, political powers, after all, we brought 50 prime young communists into this country this week. 50 brilliant Chinese scholars, 100% dedicated to communism or they would not be allowed to leave the country. Do you think they're here only to learn? Don't you think it's a sad chapter that we're really opening new relationships with the most godless society in the world today, China and also with Russia? 
Do you know the Word of God says? It says about the day in which we live, it will be distress of nations, but it adds another little phrase. It says, with perplexities. And nobody knows the way out. I want to tell you, the answer to our problem in America is not in the White House. It's in God's house. If we put that house right. And I'm here for nothing less than to share my thinking and prayers with you in the next two weeks. That God will do something that will not only change our individual lives or even the life of this church or community, but somehow that that much-needed, overdue revival, which is the only way of saving America or our, our generation, may be born in this next two or three weeks. After all, with all the disasters that are around, the greatest disaster in the world at this moment to me is a sick church in a dying world. Is recovery possible? Sure it is. <clears throat> Sure it is. And the way for the church to recover is to get that supernatural touch of the Spirit of God. I guess if we read it properly, the Word of God is the most exciting book that's ever been written. It's God's last word to man. And here again we have a picture of a man with supernatural power. Wherever he do goes, he does something no one else can do. Now, again, he, he, he's not a philosopher. There, there's no, uh, like, well, you have the, 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 the prophecy of Jeremiah, the prophecy of Isaiah and so forth. There are no great prophecies by this wonderful man, Samson. He's, he's a type of the people that do know their God. Now, that's what the Word of God says. <coughs> not the people that know their Bible. There's all the difference in the world between knowing the Word of God and knowing the God of the Word. And the Scripture says the people that do know their God shall be strong into exploit. Now here is a man who is dazzling and starting everybody by his great achievement, and so his enemies design on him and uh, they want to find his secret. Well, what's a better way than getting a woman on the job? <clears throat> And so they say to this woman, now you'll find out the secret. And she comes up to this man and she says, hey, I want to ask you a question. What's the secret of your great strength? Uh, what, 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 what vulnerable spot do you have? How can we bind you and bring you to impotence? Samson said unto her in verse 7, if they bind me with seven green wisps that were never dry, then shall I be weak. Oh, I wish he'd left that out. I wish he'd just said, if you buy me with seven green wisps, I'd be like other men. But he says, if you buy me with seven... You see, this was his secret. He knew he was supernatural. She knew he was supernatural. His enemies knew he was supernatural. But where's the supernatural in the church of God today? What is the act of the apostles? The act of the apostles is the church of Jesus Christ doing everything Jesus did when he was on earth. Apart from walking on the water, isn't that exactly what the disciples did? Well, Samson says, if you bind me with seven green wisps that were never used, then shall I be weak like other men. And they tried it and it didn't work. And then it says in verse 9, if you, pardon me, verse 11, if they bind me fast with new ropes that were never used, then shall I be weak like other men. He emphasizes it again. And then in verse 17 he says the same thing, if I be shaven and my strength go from me, I shall become weak. The great curse in the church of God today is mediocrity. The trouble with our Bible schools and seminars is we turn men out like they turn automobiles off an assembly line. They're all the same quality. They all think the same things. They all read the same notes. They all listen to the same old dried up teachers. Now don't mention that in Dallas because I have to go in a few weeks, but <clears throat> it's there. You know, the church today is so subnormal that if ever we become normal, we'll think we're abnormal. What's the secret of thy great strength? 
Oh, I suppose it's a blessing for most of us that we settle for mediocrity, huh? After all, how many men really want to sit on the circle of the earth? How many men have tried to conquer the world? Centuries ago, a young man did it. We're told at 27 years of age, Alexander the Great sat down and wept bitter tears because he conquered the world and there were no other worlds to conquer. He didn't know anything about getting on the moon, of course. <clears throat> so a young man at 27 has dominated the world militarily. In the day of many of us, there was a man by the name of Hitler. He had a little Charlie Chaplin moustache and one stripe on his arm. And every move he made was successful except the last one. Because, you see, he didn't sleep at night like we do. He stayed up till three, four, five in the morning. He studied astrology. He had a spiritist medium interpreting every move for him. And he made every move right except the last one. He came within an ace of conquering the world. And between Alexander the Great and Hitler, you had a man, a little corpulent Corsican, <coughs> by the name of Napoleon. Men st still study his military strategy. Maybe he was the greatest military strategist in history. And when he was riding the crest of the wave, and it seemed as though he was just within reaching for world domination, he gathered together his warlords. On the wall of his office, he had a great map of the world. He snapped these men to attention and said, Look at this! And he took his index finger and he ran it round the ragged edge of a great country. And as they were a bit shifty, he commanded them again. He said, Look at this! And he plunged his finger in the centre of the country he had outlined. And he said, There lies a sleeping giant. Let it sleep! He said, If that country ever wakes up with its millions of people and all its hidden mineral power and strength, if they ever combine those forces, if that giant wakes and begins to flex its muscles, let the world look out. Because, he said, that nation will dominate the world. He said that in 1835, before he went to the Battle of Waterloo. There lies a sleeping giant. Let it sleep. If it should wake up and harness its manpower to its speak other secret powers, it will shake the world. Do you know which country it was? That he outlined in 1835? China. <clears throat> China tonight has a million men guarding its border into Russia. China says she can lose 10 million men and not miss. 10 million fighting men. We have just graciously given it the formula for making atomic weapons and what have we got? There lies a sleeping giant, let it sleep. If it wakes up and harnesses its manpower to its mineral powers and other powers, it will shake the world. Dear Francis Schaeffer, one of the great thinking men, in the Church of God today, says this in his book, Death in the City, I would remind you that eight centuries ago, 800 years, every decent-sized town and city in China had a thriving New Testament church. Now think of it for a second. What was going on in America 800 years ago? 800 years ago in China? <clears throat> they were not only making the most poor, wonderful porcelain and treasuring things from the Ming dynasty and all the rest of it. They had thriving New Testament churches. Where are they today? All right, change the characters. You see, I didn't come here to hear politics. All right, change the characters. Instead of seeing Napoleon running his finger around the ragged edge of a great country, you see the devil standing there. Not with a map of the world, but a map of the ages. And he stands his demons there and says, look, see this, watch this. And he runs his finger around something and says this, there is the church of Jesus Christ asleep. Let it sleep. Because if the church of Jesus Christ ever rediscovers the resurrection power of Jesus, and every believer gets filled with the Holy Ghost, they'll shake the world. For the church is sleeping. In 
the little school I went to in England, I had a teacher. She wasn't very bright. I don't think most teachers are, but <clears throat> my teacher wasn't very bright, and uh, she was always suspicious I wasn't bright. And I found out I was right. <clears throat> you see, she told us a, a story about the the most famous character in all the writing, and you can put Hemingway or anybody else you want in the modern writers. The best known story out of all American literature is the story of Rip Van Winkle. You can go to any country in the world, Russia, China, anywhere, they know the story of Rip Van Winkle. You remember he went to sleep up by the Bible school. He didn't go to the Bible school, but he, 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 he would have gone to sleep anyhow. But anyhow, <clears throat> he went up by uh, the Hudson River and he fell asleep in Sleepy Hollow. You remember he came down the hill, he got into controversy with somebody, and all I remember about the story was that, well, he slept 50 years or 100 years, according to who tells the story. But that isn't the point of the story. My teacher missed it entirely. The fact is that when he went up the hill to go to sleep, there was a sign hanging outside of the tavern. There it waved in the breeze. And there was a picture on the sign. <coughs> it was a picture of George III, the King of England at that time. And while old Rip Van Winkle was sleeping, they painted out the face of George III and they painted in the face of another George by the name of Washington. And surely the secret of the story is not that he went to sleep for 50 years. The moral of the story is he slept through a revolution. And I'm not suggesting that. I'm telling you that's what the Church of Jesus Christ is doing today. What's the greatest threat to America tonight? Communism now. Financial bankruptcy, we're nearly there now. <clears throat> the greatest threat to America or England or, or modern life is God himself. You see, there comes a period when God quits dealing with men and there comes a period when God quits dealing with nations. Do you ever think of the fact that God was once married and he got divorced because his wife played the harlot? Don't we get excited about the week before uh, Easter and we talk about Palm Sunday and uh, Jesus made a triumphant entry into Jerusalem? Did he make a triumphant entry or did he make a tearful exit? They said, we're getting rid of you. He said, you're fools, I'm getting rid of you. Your house is desolate. For 2,000 years, God has not bothered with the bride that he had. For 2,000 years, the Jews have been a football for anybody to kick around. Isn't it amazing that a little country that you could gather in your arms and drop in one of the Great Lakes is the most expensive commodity in America today. We give them billions of dollars. We don't give a dime to Northern Ireland, which is the most Protestant country in the world. We don't talk about peace there. But we fight like mad, not to save Israel, to save our oil reserves, I think. But anyhow, it's a good cover-up. But the point is, God was once married to Israel. He divorced Israel. For 2,000 years, he hasn't bothered. She's been brutalized. God sits in heaven and watches Hitler liquidate six million Jews, we're told. <coughs> the point is, he walked out on a nation that was rebellious. Do you think he didn't walk out on America or England? Or do you think maybe he's done it and we don't know? We're still keeping up our emotions. You know what? We've got this story pretty messed up, haven't we? I said that this son, Samson, is a type of the church. She moved in supernatural power in the first century or two. In the first three centuries of Christianity, a Christian could not own a piece of property. A church could not own its own building. But it thrived, it prospered. Do you know what, you know what the breakdown of the failure of the church is? As soon as the church, church becomes rich and she can be accepted by society, she loses her anointing and she goes down the drain. The church is most healthy in the world tonight where there's persecution. The proof of that will be how many of you will make it back as many nights as you can during the next two weeks because you may be away the night the fire falls and that would be bad. Now, do you really love God enough to put everything on one side and say, God, if you're going to work, I want to be there that night. Do you love God enough to do that? Do you love your 
spiritual life enough? Do you love the church enough to do that? Do you love America enough to do that? Here is a man doing what nobody else could do. His enemies say, what's the secret of his strength? They lock him up in a city and he takes part of the city away. They send men to arrest him and he picks up the jawbone of an ass. And he slew 2,000 men with the jawbone of an ass. Isn't that something? I heard of a preacher saying, God doesn't use the jawbone of an ass anymore. An old lady said he does in our pulpit every week. <clears throat> but uh, apart from that, <clears throat> the jawbone of an ass, huh? Do, do, do you think we're really serious about having in God we trust and our coins? I read a book recently that said we're the only country within God we trust and our coins. Forget it, England had that on the coins before America was born. It's written in Latin, defender of the faith, a Protestant faith too. I mean, if in God we trust, do we need armies? Why are we taxed up to our ears? <clears throat> well, we're taxed up to our ears to pay for crime and war machines. Now, do a bit of homework. Look back in the, in the first book of Kings, I guess. Do you know one night an angel was going home and he was in a hurry and he forgot the 55 mile an hour limit and, and he rushed through a city and he, and he dragged one of his wings through a city and the wing of an angel destroyed 185,000 people? The wing of an angel destroyed 185,000 people? And Jesus says on the cross, I can call 12 legions of angels. <clears throat> That's 12 times 5,000 or 10,000, whoever you fix the legion. Make it 120,000 angels, each able to destroy 185,000 people. And I think Jesus is saying in a nice way, look, I can not only get off this cross, I can wipe the population of the world out as quick as that. That's all you want. Here is a man who is proving the power of God. He takes the jawbone of an ass and he slays a lot of chosen men. They put him inside a city, he carries away the gates of the city. <clears throat> he was quite a runner, he'd have made the Olympics because he could chase foxes and he caught foxes, 600 of them, and tied their tails together and put a faggot between their tails and he set the corn of the enemy on fire and destroyed all their crops. Well, do you wonder the enemies were after him? How does he do it? Nobody else can move like this. What's the secret of his supernatural power? <coughs> you see, we've got this man all mixed up. I like art. I, I don't understand modern art. I was in a house a while ago. A lady had a gorgeous... Oh, oh, she told me it was a gorgeous picture in the next room. I went to see it. It was a big blob of yellow on a frame. And she said, do you know what that is? I said, yes. She said, what? I said, a poached egg. She said, it's a sunrise done by sun. So I said, I wouldn't have known. I thought he just got the paint and went like that and wherever it stopped, that's it. In many art galleries in the world, I've said, you have uh, pictures of Samson and every time I see Samson, he's a superman according to our thinking. You know, the average man in Israel was this height. Saul, the king of Israel, was head and shoulders above the average man. Goliath was head and shoulders above Saul and Samson somewhere up there. Now, do you think a woman's going to be dumb enough to say to a man 19 feet high, Hey, buddy, what's the secret of your strength? Do you take Wheaties? <clears throat> I don't believe Samson was an inch taller than any other man. The Word of God cancels all our ideas of those stupid artists. We saw him with big muscles like watermelons and legs like redwood trees and a range of muscles here, little, you know, like Mr. America. He's nothing like that at all. Because the Word of God says it's not by what? By what? Nor by, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And Hebrews 11 says, Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of David and of Barak 
and of tongues, and who through his muscles are not through faith from you kingdom, <coughs> and what righteousness and obtain promises. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit. The word of God says the lame take the prey, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. And I've heard people when they've been despairing in prayer, pray like something like this, Lord, thou art able to do far more exceeding abundantly above all that we can either ask or think. And everybody says, Amen. Boy, that was a great prayer. Well, that happens to be what the Bible does not say, except in part. The Bible says that God, you know, the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, the nations are like a dust in a bucket. He sits on the circle of the earth. There's a show in Minnesota right now. You go into a theater, you get in a chair and you sit back, and, and they carry you into space, at least you think so, and they begin to tell you about the secrets of the universe. We live in a shrinking world and an expanding universe. They suddenly discover there are 150 billion stars in the Milky Way. And the little boy in England, I used to look up at them and say to my mummy, why is there that great track of light in the sky? Mother said, that's the Milky Way. It's the one super galaxy in the heavens. It has 150 million, no, billion stars. And now science says there are, there are 150 billion galaxies. And in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, it tells me that God knows the names of every one of those 150 billion stars in every one of those 150 billion galaxies. The man that wrote the hymn when I surveyed the wondrous cross, <clears throat> Isaac Watts gave us another hymn in which he says, He made the stars those heavenly flames, He counts their numbers, calls their names, His wisdom's vast and knows no bounds, The deep where all the thoughts are drowned. What is a creature's skill or force? The sprightly man, the warlike horse, the piercing wit, the active limb, all are to mean delights for him. That saints are lovely in his sight. He views his children with delight, he sees their hopes, he knows their fears, he looks and loves his image there. God doesn't glory in stars, he can blow them off the end of his tongue. Jesus didn't die to redeem stars, he died to redeem us. He died to make us the habitation of the most high God. Somebody said a while ago to one of the most brilliant Chinese scholars, you've read the Koran, you've read the Venus, you've read most of the sacred books, have you read the New Testament? Ah, he said, I read little New Testament, time number three, three times. What's the most wonderful thing in it? And the preacher thought he had the answer. The virgin birth, the physical resurrection of Jesus. He looked at the Christian and said, are you a Christian? Mm -hmm. Oh, he said, you're the most wonderful thing in the world. Well, Christian came up, you know, uh, well, we Christians aren't perfect, we're just sinners that God's patched up and, you know, we're a bit lousy like the rest of folk, we lie now and again and we're not always so honest and sometimes we'd rather watch the Crimson Tide than the Crimson Cross. <coughs> uh, uh, the uh, Chinaman said, Sir, you are the most wonderful thing on this earth. You know the Christian didn't know why, till the Chinaman, the heathen, told him. Because he said, it says at the end of Ephesians chapter 2, that you are the habitation of God. He said, Sir, does God live in you? I don't ask people if they're saved. Everybody's saved now, from Mr. Carter to Johnny Jenkins. <clears throat> Fashionable to be born again. You can see girls with bare bosoms and a cross on it, and it, it's acceptable. You can live like hell in Hollywood and be born again. I don't ask people if they're born again. I don't ask them if they're saved. I ask them, does Christ live in you? They hum and they are and say, well, now, let no, 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 come on. Either Christ lives in you or he doesn't. And if Christ doesn't live, you're still dead in trespasses and in sin. And the kind of man says you're the most amazing person who, that your God lives inside of you. There is no other religion like that. Christianity, there may be a study of comparative religion. Christianity is not a comparative religion, it's a superlative religion. 
It is the only world, religion in the world where a man's God lives inside of him. We say Jesus Christ came, you're a bad man, he came to make you good. Jesus did not come into the world to make bad men good. He came into the world to make dead men live. Samson was very much alive. All the evidence of supernatural power. Why? He subdued his enemies, that's why. As long as he was obedient, he was more than conqueror. There was no weapon formed against him that could prosper. Didn't matter what he met, he subdued all his enemies. He threw down every stronghold. Because in our language of the indwelling Christ, the indwelling power of the Spirit of God, <clears throat> oh yes, he, he pulled down the gates of the city. He destroyed their crops. He destroyed their enemies. But you know what? He was a very natural man. He fell in love. If that is natural, I suppose it is. The girl lived at Timnus, and he could go down the road that way. He could go down the road this way. And they said, you can't go that way. Why? Because, haven't you heard the news? There's a lion in the way. Do you know how many people that lion has destroyed, or maimed, or killed, or eaten? You can't go that way. Go this way. <clears throat> he went that way. And when the lion saw him, the lion said, well, here comes my lunch. Man, he looks real tasty. Samson's walking down the road with his dad and mum, and he says, Dad and mum, you're getting old. Would you sit down here a minute? I have a little business to do around the corner. And he went around the corner, and the lion sprang at him. And what did he do? He took it by its jaws and ripped it as though it were a kid of the goats. Well, that's a miracle. The second half of the text is more miraculous. Do you know what it says? That after he destroyed the lion, he said nothing about it. Well, at least we'd have photographed the thing, wouldn't we? I mean, <clears throat> I mean, after all, you can't destroy the biggest, longest, fiercest, strongest, mightiest lion in the world and let it go by like that. I mean, you've got to show the relatives and everybody else and put it on the front of the church magazine. There was a lion in the way. Well, then if Samson is a type of a spiritual man, the, devil, the, the lion is a type of the devil that goes about seeking whom he may devour. Now listen, the tragedy of America tonight is not due to the fact of all the immorality and sin and shame. It's due to the paralysis of the church. This is a warfare. There's a battle in the heavenlies right now against the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. One day my son David will talk to you about binding the strong man. I used to have a little old man that came to a church I pastored in England in 1933, 4, 5. A church where we had constant revival for three years, where people lined up outside on a Sunday night to get in. This little man did not have good health. He was very poor. His shirt was always clean but ragged. I said to him one day, Mr. Furnival, please don't bother to come on the Sabbath morning or Sabbath evening. I can't teach you anything. You've walked with God about 50 years. I'm in my 20s. What can I teach you? But I said, make me a promise. You'll never, never, never miss the prayer meeting. We got about 200, maybe 250 people to our prayer meeting, and it was a prayer meeting. It began at 7.30 on a Wednesday night. We never knew the end. I never told them when it would close because I didn't know. It would go on two hours and three hours, praying with fervency and sweat and tears. That little man was a spark plug every time in that prayer meeting. I'd see him come down the aisle and sit in the front and say, Well, hallelujah, we, we're on our way tonight. Furnival's here. <clears throat> and somewhere in his praying, he would pray this, Lord, teach us what is flesh and what is spirit. And teach us how to bind and how to loose. I don't care whether it's this church. I've been for a whole month in Dr. Charles Stanley's lovely church there in First Baptist. Great big place, packed with 3,500 people every Sunday morning, 2,500 every Sunday night. A great thriving church. I said the same there as I'll say here or in a country church, that no church is stronger than its prayer meeting. That's the powerhouse. 
I like singing. <clears throat> I wish we'd spend as much time training people to pray as we taught them to try to teach them to sing. There was a line in the way, didn't bother Samson. He just walked up to that line, the line sprang at him, and with that supernatural strength, you see there's something in his life which is the most precious thing this side of eternity. I know some men intellectual wizards. I couldn't count on my fingers and toes all the millionaires and multi-millionaires that I know. I don't esteem them for their social standing or intellectual strength necessarily. But I happen to know some of the greatest men in the world today. I was invited to join a prayer meeting tomorrow morning in England that's going to go on for 72 hours. To join a little praying friend of mine who prays between six and eight hours every day. In a sophisticated society like ours, when everybody counts uh, by their senses, even if they're Christians, what we can see and smell and handle and write our names on, the perishing things of clay. I met a man about four years ago. I walked into his presence and bowed. As I went out, I walked backwards, and as I walked backwards, I got to the door and I said, Thank you, thank you, sir. Because my mother said, if you ever get into the presence of royalty, you never turn your back on the king. You always go out and say, thank you, thank you, and then you say graciously, thank you, Your Honor. And as I left the room, I said, thank you, Your Honor. Oh, he wanted to thank me for the books I'd written, and now they'd bless him. I said, not a word, not a word, not a word. The book's on the other foot tonight. Side two. They carried that man out of his room uh, on the 9th of February, come next month, or the month after the 9th of February, one, two, three years ago, in America, not in 1760, three years ago, they carried that man out in his 90th year. And would you believe it? When they carried him through the little door of his frame house, it was the first time he'd been out of that door in twelve and a half years that he hadn't been to bed one night for thirty years and somebody says did he sleep well what do you think he was he's not supernatural in that sense He'd learned to push the day around. But every night at 10 o'clock he went to pray by himself. He prayed till 5 or 6 in the morning when the burden lifted. He read half of Psalm 119, half of the long version of the, of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He learned Hebrew and Greek. He'd been over there in Palestine, as it was then, or Israel, to be a missionary. And when he got there, God said, you go back to uh, America. But, but I've just left America. Go back to America. What will people think? It doesn't matter what they think. You go and travel and pray for America. And he said not long before he died to a friend of mine, God has given me a witness in the last great moving of the Spirit, just before the total tribulation breaks on the earth of the wrath of God. There will be a revival. I call it a Pentecost that will out Pentecost, Pentecost. And he said one billion people will be saved in that revival. How will it come? It will come when this mysterious thing this man has. Read about this man. What is he going to do? He's going to take a line and tear it apart. He's going to pull down the strongholds. He's going to meet his enemies and destroy them. What does it say? It says the most amazing thing you can say about any man on earth that ever lived. It says the Spirit of God rested upon him. And brother, you may be as rich as the Crephus or the Dupont or the Rocky Fellows, but God Almighty says when it comes to the Holy Ghost, your money perish with you. You can't buy the Holy Ghost if you give God ten million dollars. He comes to broken and contrite spirit. There's a battle going on. And you might well heed what the pastor said this morning. I've got a lovely son over there. He has a very beautiful wife. 
My other son is teaching in a university in West Africa. He has a lovely wife. My other son is at home right now. He has to go for surgery this week. I'm sorry. He's got a terrible attack of kidney stones. And the guy's just back from the mission field. He's been living on peanuts down there in the hottest country politically in the world. He's never asked me for a penny as long as he lives. Just before he left Argentina, they have a little baby. Do you know what he pays for milk? For the baby, eight dollars a gallon? The highest inflation rate in the world. The pastor said this morning, don't wait till your son gets fascinated with some slut. Or your daughter gets fascinated with some guy because he shoots pool well and he smokes and drinks and has a fancy automobile. I started praying for David's wife when he was five years of age. And I prayed for all my boys to get their wives when they were five. Not to get their wives when they were five. <clears throat> it's going to move up to that before long, the way we're going. But, and they get divorced at six. But uh, by the time they were five, I, were praying for, I was praying for every one of those boys to get the right wife. And they got lovely wives. All right, let's come to this. Samson, what does he do? He sees the lion. Tell me that a lady in Australia said to me one day, she said, Mr. Raiden, I want to tell you something. Go ahead. She said, I've had a terrible day today. I said, you look like it. If the devil had a wife, she looked like the wife, I'll tell you that. She looked that miserable and tormented. I've had a terrible day today. What happened? This morning when I got out of bed, the devil was standing on the rug at the side of my bed. I looked at her lovely blue eyes. I said, woman, how conceited can you get? What are you going to do today? Make Christmas cakes. Oh, well, I said, he happens to be allergic to Christmas cakes. I know that. That's one thing Satan doesn't like. I looked at her. I said, lady, I doubt if he even knows you're alive. And if the devil was in your room, you should be glad about it. Why? Because he couldn't be anywhere else in the world. He, doesn't, he isn't omnipresent like God. He can't be in two places at the same time. God can, Satan can't. People say, do you know what the devil said to me today? Have you ever noticed the Apostle Paul never said that once in 14 epistles he began given in Hebrews? He never said the devil suggested this or that to it. Boy, we think we're prizes, don't we? Do you know what the devil said to me? I doubt he knows you're living. Does he push you around? Do you push him around? Now, I'm, I'm old. I'm not old. I'm antique. <laughs> I've been preaching 56 years, so I won't tell you how old I am, but I've been preaching 56 years. I've been around a few corners. I still have an ambition. To write better books? No, I'd like to do that. Get your name up with the top evangelist? That would be an insult. <clears throat> what do you want? I'd like my name in letters about 15 feet high, big red letters, 20 feet high, 25 feet high. Where? In hell. In hell? In hell, H-E-L-L. Why? Because I figure if Leonard Radnell or Fred Wolf or maybe somebody else is not known in hell, they're not worth a hill of beans. Do you remember one day some men decided to knock the devil out of somebody else and they went and jumped on the man and the demons jumped out and kicked the preacher around? And the poor old preacher looked up and do you know what the demon said? Oh, this is a, this is a honey if you like. Do you know what the demon said? Jesus I know. And Paul I know. I think, that, I think that's the greatest thing that could ever be said about a man. Satan's got a danger list. He's got the ten most wanted men in the world this last day of 1978. He's got a danger list. One, two, eight. Now, I would rather be the last man on that list of the most wanted men in hell than the first man on any list on earth. Jesus, I know. This is a testimony of a demon. And Paul, we know. 
And then he said, but who are you? In other words, I never heard about you. You know, when this church is dropped, I may get fired tonight, that's all right. <clears throat> when this church really grows up, you'll have a room somewhere, and I believe you do have a 24-hour prayer with me, that, that's fine. But you know, just as we elect deacons and others, we'll find men who have ministries of intercession, and there is some place in the church where those men don't bother whether they're seen or heard or known or not. They, they spend their lives in intercession. Pulling down strongholds. Putting barriers up in the heavenlies that the devil and demons can't cross. Let me give you one illustration and hurry over it. On my book in the motel there, I, I found me on my bed, I have a book, I'm going to read it. I've read it once, it's Bloomheart's Battle. About a hundred years ago, in Germany, there was a, a man, a Lutheran preacher, was asked to pray for a girl who was possessed of evil spirits, and he did this. And the demons came out, and he became quite famous for casting out demons. And one day, somebody said to him, you know, there's a girl up in the hills there, and she's demon-possessed. I was preaching in the first Presbyterian church in Marshall last year. There's a very beautiful girl came up at the end of the meeting, and she said, Mr. Raven, I want to tell you something. She said, at least four times tonight while you were preaching, you disappeared and, and, and all the picture of the exorcist came up. I, I could see all those demonic things. I couldn't see the church. And then they would disappear and you would come back. And then you would disappear and they come back. And I said, why did you go see those filthy things? Now, if you give place to demons, if you start fooling around with Ouija boards and all that up, well, okay, but before long you'll get trapped in it, so you better watch. One of the signs of the day in which we live is the, is the growth of the occult. Do you know there are 2,000 gurus in America today and mostly they have the most successful ministries with young intellectual Jews and uh, highbrow people. And if you go to India, it's the filthiest country in the world. It's full of superstition and degradation and they come to teach us in a Christian country. Bloomhart went to pray for this girl. She tore her dress. She spit some green phlegm at him. She used every obscenity you could dream of. He stayed at the foot of that bed for eight hours. And at the end of the eight hours, he was wringing wet with sweat. And all the way home, the demons were saying, Well, Jesus could cast us out, but you can't. After all, the Bible's only a printed book. It doesn't get any further than the page. And Folk in church don't expect anything like that. Uh, you, you just send sick people to the psychiatrist. You send other sick people to the hospital. Jesus didn't. The early church didn't. Our church does. He went a second day. To tell you the story, condense it. Do you know what? He went every day for ten months to the foot of that bed and prayed eight hours a day, every day, for ten months. And every night he went home, he was so weak, he could hardly get into his bed. He would wake up with the same burn, he would wake up with weakness, he would wake up with perspiration. He'd go back to that bed and the demons would mark and the girl would cast and her face would change colour and she'd vomit this green spew out of her mouth and she'd spring obscenities and most degrading things until the atmosphere was polluted. And every day he went, would you have done that, Pastor? Would I have done that? We'd have said, put chains on her and kick her into some psychiatric ward and let the state take care of her. But Broomheart says, this is a challenge of demon power to the power of the risen Son of God. <clears throat> the last day that he was there, he felt a surge of power. The girl seemed to have it and she came out so violent they had to hold her. And she went through the same routine of Green froth came to her mouth, her obscenities came out, she carried on and so forth. And he said, I felt a surge of life, and suddenly he said, this is the end. Now look, you demon. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come out! People down in the village said, as we would say, it was like a dozen train, tra a freight trains going through. It was like a hundred jets going over. They heard this rumble. The demons came out of her in hundreds, all confessing their names. And she sat up in bed with a radiant, beautiful face like an angel and said, I'm free, I'm clean.
That ministry grew until the Kaiser sent a sum of money. Until the government gave, I forget the name now, Bley, I think it was, a town in Germany where they gave them a disused auditorium and they filled it with sick beds and demented people. And do you know what? Just about a hundred years ago, people were going in ships from America, fast bound in jackets of steel. And they were going all the way there to Europe. The little Lutheran minister with a team of men he had now would stand over those demon-possessed people. And cast them out. And send them home. I do not believe there's any place on God's earth more exciting than the sanctuary when the Holy Ghost is moving. I don't think it necessarily means that every crippled arm is stretched out or every blind eye is open or every deaf ear is unstopped. It does mean that supernatural working begins and this is my goal these days along with you. I'm praying for you. Do you know what I'm praying? I'm praying some of you will have sleepless nights. Isn't that nice? I'm praying some of you that have hidden sin for years will have to confess it. The last two meetings were in Dr. Charles' church one night. The Holy Ghost was there. I sat down. And we must have sat 10 minutes or 15 minutes. The woman got up and made a confession. And two hours after, the meeting was still going on with confession. The same thing happened in, uh, uh, what was the Valley Church that we were in in Louisville just a few months ago. The promise of God is we shall be more than conquerors through him that loved us. The Spirit of the living God upon us. And no weapon that's formed against us shall prosper. Samson subdues his enemies. Samson destroys the lion which is a type of the devil. Oh, I could have summarized it all much quicker than that. You see, the secret of this man is this. It's not his long hair. If long hair was the secret of power, most of our churches would explode. <clears throat> it, wasn't, it wasn't a case of long hair. You read the story, what do you discover? Hmm? It was disobedience that brought disaster. Finally, the woman gets to speak and he says, I'll tell you what it is. It's not a case of uh, green wisps and new ropes. You see my hair in a coil? I'm a Nazarite. Three things a Nazarite could not do. He could not drink wine, a sign of worldly pleasure. He could not touch anything dead, a sign of people who are dead in trespasses and in sin. And thirdly, he had to wear long hair as a reproach that he was different from other men. And as long as he kept his vows, he, he kept his power. She came up with the old weapon, you know, when she couldn't get away. She said, well, you don't love me. Oh, that's an old one, isn't it? And a new one, that's what you I said this week. But that's the weapon. You don't love me. Oh, shut up, of course I love you. He said, listen, I'll tell you what it is. There's nothing much to it. You see, I'd never drunk wine in my life. I'd never touched anything that was dead. That was, a, that was a whole tragedy. He went back to that animal that he had killed and he touched the flesh, the dead thing. And then from there he began to deteriorate. He said, you can't go destroying enemies. You can't go around doing the things you're doing. You'll lose your health. Now just slip your head on my lap and have a sleep. You know, if he'd stayed on his knees, he'd never have got on hers. I don't care what a man does, backsliding. You say about a certain man, he used to be on TV, he had a great show, now he's living with another woman, he's living in adultery, he drinks, he does this, he's a backslider. No, 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 he backslid months ago, that's the evidence of his backsliding. Every man backslides in his prayer life, first of all. He backslides in his devotional life, first of all. He slips his head on the lap of the woman, she slips the locks off his hair, and she says the things she said over and over, the Philistines be upon thee. And then it says one of the most tragic words in the scripture. He says, I'll go out as at other times. And it says, he wished not. He didn't know the Spirit of God had departed from him. You know, we've got so many churches where the Holy Ghost hasn't moved for years. We go through the mechanics, we sing a nice hymn, we say, wasn't it blessed, wasn't the choir wonderful, wasn't it a good message? And we know in our hearts of hearts the breathing of the Spirit of God was not there. 
He wished not the Spirit of God had departed. I'll go out and do as another man as other times. And she said, the, the Philistines were upon there. They came and they took him like that. All right, you can summarize this story like this. What was the first thing they did? Bind him. What was the second thing they did? Blind him. What was the third thing they did? Grind him. They put him in the basement. They put out his eyes. They fasten him there to a, a treadmill. He goes round and round day by day, grinding the corn that he took out of their mouths. Are you going to suggest I'm wrong when I say if you'd gone down into that basement, that man who could one day make a nation tremble and destroy an army and pull down a city and, and, and tear up a lion, he's now in bondage. <coughs> Are you going to suggest those sightless eyes never had any tears? Are you going to try and persuade me the groaning of his spirit wasn't louder than the groaning of the machine he was working on? Are you going to try and persuade me he didn't remember the day when the glory of God and he was the most powerful man on earth and all his enemies trembled? Look, if your children were reading the Bible tomorrow and they asked you why the church doesn't do today what she used to do, what's your answer? Have you dispensationalized the Holy Ghost out of his job? When the church is not supernatural, she's superficial. The only thing that marks them out as a different institution in the world of men is there's something mysterious, indefinable, that cannot be gotten with money or education or science or any other way. And it's the brooding of the Spirit of God. Here's a poor man. He's lost his sight. He's lost his freedom. He's lost his family. He's lost all his honor. Here he is in his misery. And he hears a tap, 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 tap. And he turns his sightless eyes and says, Who art thou? And a boy says, I'm a boy. What kind of a boy? A Philistine. What do you want? This must have cut him like taking a dagger and stabbing it through into his heart. He said, I have come to take you. There was a day when 2,000 men couldn't take him and now a boy takes him. You're taking me where? I'm taking him into the temple of Dagon, the fish god. They have a conference. They've been asking to see Samson, the man that once terrified their armies. They've been asking about the man that somehow had something so mysterious and supernatural. Again, that's the mark of the church of the living God. Two minutes, go back into the ten, ten chapters previous to this. What's the story? It's the story of another man with supernatural power by the name of Gideon. A story we like to tell to children. He was threshing corn in the middle of the night, not the middle of the day. And an angel came and said to him, Sam, uh, uh, Gideon, God is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. If the angel had said that to me in those circumstances, I'd have turned around and said, so angels tell jokes too, eh? God is with me. Look, angel, you see that cave? That's where I live. The next cave is where my uncle lives. The next cave is where my other folk live. We're the anointed of God and we're in subjection to the Midianites. What are you talking about? Gideon didn't say that. Gideon said, listen, angel, you tell me that God is with me. This is the answer he shot back. If God be with us, where be his miracles our fathers told us of? My wife and I have been alone for the last 12 years. The boys, Paul, David's been in New Zealand and New Guinea. Paul has been in the center of South America. Philip is on the west coast of Africa. We've been alone for 12 years. David came home with his three daughters. My other son's home with his two daughters and a, a boy. And... Uh, It suddenly made a change in things. But you know, when I get those little fellows on my knees, I think it's not far back since I sat on my grandmother's knee. And Gideon says, you say that God is with us. Where's the supernatural manifestation? I think he's saying, I sat on my grandpa's knee, who told me when he sat on his grandpa's knee, he told him how one day they walked through a big tank and waved to the fishes going through because he happened to walk through the Red Sea. And they got up every morning and they had wheat is straight from heaven. 
They called it manna. It's almost the same thing. But the Lord opened the windows of heaven and sent wheaties down every morning. They wore their suits for 40 years and they never smelt sweaty. And they wore their shoes for 40 years and they didn't wear out. And at night, if they got nervous, they lifted up the side of the tent and said, Don't worry, there's a pillar of fire in the middle of the, tank, uh, in the, middle of the tabernacle. In other words, they walked on miracle, they ate miracle, they saw miracle, and yet they never entered the promised land. And we've got people today that want to see miracles, but they don't want God to invade their lives. If God is with us, where be his miracles? I'm sick to death of the church standing on the side of the road watching the parade go by. I want to see God come on the church till the others stand on the side of the road and watch the church go by. Come on, Samson. He takes Samson by the hand. It says there are 3,000 people in the gallery. Well, there's a good crowd in the gallery tonight, but uh, uh, only a third maybe of what's down here. So if they had, uh, what, 3,000 in the gallery? Maybe there are 6,000 in the other part. Maybe there are 10,000 in the auditorium. And when Samson comes in, they say, Now, you're not serious. <laughs> you not, don't really mean this is the seller. I mean, you know... I thought Samson was up there with bulging muscles. You, you mean to say that this little guy here is the one that terrified our nation and, uh, and destroyed the uh, lion and, uh, and, and did all those things? And Samson says, Son, I've been in the temple of Dagon sightseeing. Don't you have two large pillars on the platform? And he said, yes. He said, would you, would, would you put me between those pillars? And he said, yes. No man is greater than his prayer life. Samson had lived a life that was spectacular with the miraculous, but the greatest miracle came at the end. When he's standing there on the platform, he prays, listen to his prayer. Samson called on the Lord and said, O oh Lord, remember I pray thee and strengthen me. Listen, just one. Just one. Look, in a few hours we're going to step into a new year. We step into a new year every day anyhow. But, 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 but it's a bit different. It's number one on the calendar. Do you think you dare pray, do you think you dare pray this prayer to a holy God tonight, Lord? This past year is full of failure, weakness. I haven't kept the vows I made. I haven't kept the promises. I haven't fasted as I said I would. I haven't prayed as I said I would. I haven't tithed as I said I would. I haven't read the word of God. Now, Lord, I'm going on record here in Mobile tonight in this lovely church. Put it down on the eternal computer that tonight I ask you for one more chance. Strengthen me once, and I know he meant it Why? He said, strengthen me once, O God, that I may be avenged of the Philistines with my two eyes. And he took all of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, on which it was borne up, the one with his right hand and on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Now I know he means business. He says, Almighty God, I would rather live the next six months with the anointing of God on me than live another 60 years like the last year I've lived. Now tell me this, if you live next year, next 365 days, if the Lord spares you, will the devil know you're around? <clears throat> because every member of this church is either an asset or a liability. You're either part of the problem or part of the answer. Lord, he says, strengthen me just once. Even if I die. Now, now, don't pray that if you don't mean it, because God Almighty may take you at your word. On the other hand, he may slay you because you've fooled your days up anyhow. Just give me one more chance. That's all I'm asking. Not two, one. Give me one more chance in the anointing of the Spirit. And you know what? God did exactly that. How? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Samson said, let me die with the Philistines, and he bowed himself with all his might. He pushed out the pillars, and the house fell on the lords, and all the people that were there. 
How do I know that he triumphed? Because he said, So then the dead which he slew at his death were more than all that he slayed in his life. That last one anointing of God did not take years. It took only moments, as it were. And in that moment, that supernatural power, he pulled, pushed the pillars out, and the house came down, and he killed more in his dying than in his living. All right, one thing. I went to a wedding a while ago. I've been to very many. As the bride came down the aisle, this thought came to me. You've been to dozens of weddings. This bride happened to be the only daughter of a friend of mine who is a multi-millionaire. She inherits all his land from these many. He has two big stately homes. He has a yacht. And as she came down the aisle, I thought, wow, you look beautiful today. And suddenly this hit me. Look, you've seen many brides, tall ones, short ones, rich ones, poor ones, fat ones, thin ones. Have you ever seen a dirty bride? I saw girls get married in the Depression in the 1930s in England when they took a pair of curtains that mother had and made a kind of mantilla and, and, and they, they, they did something with the thing, you know, put something on it and they came down the aisle as well. They were dressed in pearls. I've never seen a dirty bride. You imagine a girl going to get into the, into the beautiful carriage that's going to take her or the limousine and just as she's getting in, mother says, darling, you've been up since five o'clock this morning. You've tried your wedding veil on 20 times and your dress 30 times and your shoes this and now you're ready to go. Now, sweetheart, you know, you, 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 know, you may faint. Now, darling, look, just as you get in the carriage, here, here. And she gives her a nice big hot dog with mustard and uh, uh, all the other junk on it. And uh, then in the other hand, she gives her a nice little uh, cut glass uh, styrofoam cup. And uh, she, she says, now, now, sweetheart, be careful. And, and the bride's going down in those quite excited. And suddenly a dog runs in the way and the driver puts the brake on. Whoop! Down a dress. Ugh. Tomato. Hot dog, mustard, coffee. Ooh. The bride stand, bridegroom standing there, you know, thinking about this angel coming down, and and he looks and he says, "Ooh." And he says, "Hey, what happened? You're a mess. You're disgusting. Oh, you you look wretched. What what?" And she says, "Well, I'll tell you what happened." You know, some people try to tell me Jesus will come before I go to bed tonight, but they happened to tell me that 70 years ago, too. Don't worry, Jesus isn't coming tonight. For two reasons. Number one, the world isn't evangelized. Number two, the bride is too filthy for him to come for. Eliezer was a type of the Holy Spirit who searches for the bride. I don't think so, because it says in the book of the Revelation, what? The bride hath made herself ready. Hmm? The bride. He's coming for a bride. What's she dressed in? She's dressed in white, in purity. The greatest need in the church tonight is a revival of holy living. Love that is pure is passionate. Do you think you dare pray Samson's prayer tonight? Do you dare you really pray? Three hundred thirty nine. Let's sing it. Three hundred thirty nine. Let's stand. This is an American hymn. It was written by a man who lost four daughters in a tragedy. He was a millionaire. And he lost everything he had. But notice what he wrote. <clears throat> Let's stand and sing it. When peace like a river. 339. <clears throat> Not too fast. When peace like a river attendeth my way, sing it. When sorrows like sea fill all through, whatever my lot thou hast. 
like you to sing a lie at the end of this year. Some of you are singing it and it's not true. And if there's anything worse than telling lies, it's singing them. Is it really well with your soul tonight? Is your prayer life really healthy at the end of 78? Is your love for souls really healthy? Is your devotional life healthy? Uh, do, you, do you read his book like you read a love letter? For after all, that's what it is. This third stanza I think is thrilling. My sin. Oh, the bliss, that's a word we don't use too much. Oh, the thrill, the joy of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. Do you know, we sang this a few weeks ago in Dr. Charles Stanley's great church on the Friday night. On the Sunday night, he stood up and he said to that great congregation, he said, listen, I, I, I want to tell you something, and I don't know what, how I can tell you. He said, Friday night, when Brother Adriel said that third stanza, my sin, oh, the bliss, not my sins, the sin that's been dominating my life. You see, when you went through that tank, as I call it sometimes, that little river up there, when, when you went down in that water, you know, you stood up, and when the pastor put you under, what would you do? You were cut off from the world above. You couldn't breathe its air, you couldn't see it, you couldn't smell it, you couldn't touch it. You were telling the world outside that when you went under there, you died to this world. All its pleasure, its pomp, its pride, its greed, its lasciviousness, you were saying, I go on record that it says in the sixth chapter there of Romans that when he was crucified, I was crucified and I'm buried with him in baptism and this is where I die. Now, did you or did you just try and get rid of a lot of lousy sins? When you came up out of that water, could you really say I became a new creation? My temper had gone. My secret lusts had gone. My covetousness had gone. My griping spirit had gone. If it didn't, you didn't get the right thing. You see, Jesus didn't die to do something for us, merely, but something in us. And he wants us to be free from all bondage. My sin. I can remember the night when I got saved when I was less than 15 years of age. I remember going to an altar when I was about 18 because I knew an inward bondage. Jealousy, pride ate me up. And I remember going there and when a man came and said, what do you want God to do? I said, I want him to make Romans 6, 7 really in my life. He said, you mean Romans 6, 6? No, I said, Romans 6, 7. He said, it's 6, 6. I said, it's 6, 7. What's 6, 7? He that is dead is freed from sin. I want to die. Die, die, die. I can't die. People say, die to yourself. You can't die to yourself. Unless somebody chops your head off. You can die to self-seeking, self-pity, self-glory, self-satisfaction. All the hyphenated sins, you are an entity. God made you like that. And it means that self is dethroned and he is enthroned. And once I get there, he can ask anything of my life. We're going to sing the rest of the hymn, but listen, don't sing a lie. If you're not where God wants you tonight, if your spiritual life is, is not healthy, you'd better get it straightened out before the midnight hour. And you can come to this altar and don't stay for five minutes, kiss the ground and say, Lord, I'm sorry, stay here until God does some surgery. Till he gets down there and cuts away that bad temper, that bitter temper, that ill feeling, that conceit, all that other stuff that still remains there. Don't sing it for the past. He's going to sing it for himself. We're all going to sing it for us. My sin, oh, the, what should be setting sin tonight? Pride, secret lust, anger, temper, covetousness. Come on, what is it? Will you let him nail it to the cross? Will you say, I want to end this year that's been a year of failure? Well, I'll end the year in victory anyhow. And walk with him and say, Lord, strengthen me just once, even if you bury me within six months, I don't care. But give me six months of living with Holy Ghost anointing. He may give you six years, I don't know.